All right. Hey, good afternoon, Ryan. How are you doing today? Hey, Jorge. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I can't complain. Um, just trying to, to get through the day and uh, hopefully the winter storm that's coming this weekend isn't going to be too bad. Um, I don't know if I could handle my, my son. He's already getting a little, uh, <laughs> what's the term, like cabin fever. And uh, he needs to get outside a little bit more. He thinks that uh, the winter is just too cold, too cold. Uh, for those that don't know, he's three years old. So <laughs> I think you need to get out there with him. He'll have a blast. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, today's topic, as everyone uh, who signed up is aware, is looking forward 2022 and talking a little bit about what happened for the trail movement in 2021. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's attending today, some of our strongest supporters for, for being on this call and for being um, great supporters past and present and future. Uh, so the way I kind of wanted to kick off this discussion, Ryan, was I was thinking about this yesterday on our all call meeting, uh, all staff meeting, when somebody was telling a story about how they found a letter written to, well, it wasn't even Rails to Trails Conservancy at that, at that point. It was predating the, the, the founding of the organization, but it was, I believe, written to David Burwell, and you correct me if I'm wrong, and it was talking about the idea of the Rock Island and Katy connections in Missouri. And the reason I want to talk about it, this first is because I really feel like it kind of, one, points out a big win that happened in 2021, of course, but it also kind of sets up a framework to talk about some of the things that have happened in the past year in regards to the infrastructure bill passing and kind of what's ahead. Uh, do you want to kind of tell that, that story a little bit about the, the letter too, if you want to touch on that? Yeah, I'm happy to, and, and great to be with you, Jorge. Thank you everyone for joining. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for your very generous support. I think we did this about a year ago and fun to come back and see what's happened since then. So for those who might not know, what Jorge is referring to is the Rock Island Corridor in central Missouri. It's a 144 mile disused rail corridor that has been planned and desired to be a rail trail for a very long time. Uh, and it was a great capstone to 2021. Essentially in December, almost 30 years of advocacy came to fruition when the state of Missouri formally announced that the Rock Island Corridor will be its next state park. So huge victory and a year that was filled with challenge and triumph. It was just kind of the most appropriate capstone we could have we could have thought of. So what Jorge is referring to is in December there was an event to announce that that big victory. Governor Parson announced this huge development, and I should say what's really exciting is that Rock Island will be a 144 mile rail trail, passing through many wonderful communities through Central Missouri. It will ultimately link to the Katy Trail and when connected will form essentially kind of a football shaped loop of 450 miles. And as much as you know, it's the it will be the longest in the world. It's quite an experience to do either parts of it or the, the whole thing together. But in preparing for that event, our uh, senior policy strategy, strategist, Marianne Fowler was looking through the archives in terms of the whole history of, of Rock Island. And she came across a letter from a man named Ben Duffield addressed to David Burwell, one of our co-founders, um, in January of 1986, essentially asking uh, what could be possible, could there be some assistance provided to making this a rail trail. That was a few months before RTC was even founded. So I think it shows one, that persistence pays off, that if you put in many, many years of advocacy, form a whole community to make something as important as a rail trail, um, it can happen but also it takes a ton of tenacity and hard work. And we were just so grateful to all of our partners who put in so much effort um, and commitment to the state, to Ameren, the energy company that had the rail corridor. It was quite a way to end the year. Um, and I believe Peter Harnick is, is on this call. Hi, Peter. And Peter is uh, RTC's other co-founder and of course was integral to all that process. So we all felt so gratified to see this happen in December. Yeah, really great news. I mean, um, I visited the Rock Island, I guess it was about five years ago for a Trailblazer tour. And I remember uh, visiting what will one day be a tunnel that'll be part of the Rock Island and thinking like, oh, this is so close, maybe in 10 or 15 years. So for all this news to happen, um, 
relatively quickly, I would say it's kind of amazing to, to, to watch. And I believe you touched on it. I don't know if I'm repeating myself, but part of this is also tied to infrastructure uh, bill funding. Is that correct? Well, it will certainly. And I should say this was a big moment in terms of the state rail banking, the corridor, essentially moving to the next step of trail development. But of course, then you have to develop the trail and there's tons of design and planning that's involved. And of course, the need for significant resources. And that really in some ways ties to one of the biggest victories last year, which was the, the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in November. Something that RTC and partners had been working on also for years and years and years. And uh, it was a big moment for us. In the infrastructure bill, there's an increase, almost a doubling of the transportation alternatives program from 750 million to 1.3 billion each year. I'll add to that that there's a new program that RTC helped craft called the Connecting America's Active Transportation System Act, a bit of a mouthful, but a new program that's focused specifically on connectivity, on funding interconnected trail systems in cities and towns and long distance spines like the Rock Island. So what was so gratifying was just to see the uh, federal government understand the importance the value of trails when it comes to community wellness, economic development, all the things that rail trails provide. And the Rock Island is just one example of an opportunity now that can really accelerate with this much bigger commitment and investment. Speaking of acceleration, with this new sources source of funding, the sources of funding, I think we've raised grants also, do you see the trail movement kind of get in a big boost? Um, do you have anything that you could kind of point out to that is not next, but um, in the pipeline, you would say? Well, I think the, the pandemic for as harrowing and challenging as it's been, and we shouldn't discount that it's just been um, something I think we will all still reckon with in terms of what it's meant individually as families and communities to, to persevere through this. It has been an opportunity for the trails movement to be of service in a very different way. And I'll note, and I might've said some of this in our session a year ago, but uh, that was at the end of 2020. And what we saw then was that there was this significant change in the value and awareness and understanding of the importance of trails and of active transportation and of safe places to walk, bike and be active. In March of 2020, as people were essentially locked down in different ways, had limited ways to get out and be active, you saw a 200% increase in trail usage nationally. Uh, over the course of that summer, that uh, ultimately settled to about 50% above the previous year. What's really quite exciting and interesting, though, is that in 2021, that increased usage has sustained at about 50% of previous years. And so what we saw was a, essentially a social movement different from what normally happens. Normally when there's a big change in the way that people value or um, support something, there's a change first in attitudes. There's kind of an awareness of this, uh, this new opportunity or issue. And then people change their behaviors sometime after. The behavior change follows over time. What we saw here with the value of trails was essentially a simultaneous change in the attitudes and behaviors about the value of safe places to walk, bike, and be active. And I would say, Jorge, in terms of what that's meant for the trails movement, is that we've been extraordinarily successful at making trails available to millions of people across the country. Uh, when RTC was first founded, when David and Peter first founded the organization, there were a few hundred rail trails across the country. They existed, but they were limited and in different places. Currently, there are 24,000 miles, 24,000 miles of rail trails across the country, about 35,000 miles of multi-use trails. So we've been able to make this asset widespread and available, but the real missing piece was getting the public and decision makers to understand these weren't just nice things to have, they're essential community assets. And that's what's happened. And I think that is really, in, in many ways, the exciting steps ahead for us is that you have both a change in understanding and valuing and now a lot more resources 
to make trails even more ubiquitous across the country. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, the, the importance of trails just continues to inspire people to, to join RTC as members to support um, and also is driving Trail Link. Uh, I think we were talking about this yesterday too in the, the meeting. Trail Link um, usage and signups continues to, to soar, um, which is a great thing because it gives people access to their local trails to find them and to, to use them. Um, kind of want to switch for the well, then, Hori, let, let me ask you because you're in you're in Philly, which is a great trail town with the circuit trails. What have you seen? Have you seen differences <laughs> in how people are are using the asset or even thinking about it? So, for those who are familiar with Philadelphia, I live about one mile from um, what's called Forbidden Drive. I live about a mile and a half or so from the Schuylkill River Trail. Uh, I specifically moved to the neighborhood that I live in, Germantown, to be close to trails. Um, and my commute used to be all on trail. It was awesome. Uh, and I guess it was March, March 2020. It was like a Saturday morning and everything was beginning to be shut down. And I was like, oh, let's let's go walk on Forbidden Drive. My son was about, she's like nine months at the time. So he couldn't really go on a bike at that point. Um, and it was packed. The trails were packed in a way that I'd never, ever, ever seen them. And they continue to be not, not to that extent packed anymore, but very heavily used and a lot of new riders. And for, for me, I know a lot of people work in the bicycle industry, bike shops, mechanics, et cetera. And um, you still can't buy a bike or uh, really get a, a bike easily repaired because so many people are out riding trails. So yeah, I think yeah. that the, something else. The, the, the usage is sustaining. Um, but I did want to switch for the sake of time here. And I also want to remind people, if you have questions, please type them in um, as we go. Uh, I kind of want to talk about 2022 and the, the look ahead. Um, mm -hmm. We are going to be getting, um, as we said, this, this new sources of funding to, to create and maintain trails. Can you talk a little bit about implementation and how RTC is working on that? Yeah, you bet. And and let me just note, this is 2021, but but continues into 2022. I've talked a lot about the infrastructure bill, but we're just seeing investment in trails coming from all different places. Uh, there's a program called RAISE, which was called BUILD, which was called TIGER, which is how the federal government supports a lot of different forms of transportation. They had their most recent round in November of a billion dollars. And in that, that round and allocation, 40% went either to trails, walking and biking, or some form of pedestrian safety. That's a percentage that is almost exponentially large than we've seen before. So it's really quite exciting in terms of what's ahead. And, and really RTC's role in many ways shifts from advocacy around the creation of these programs to helping communities, partners, groups all across the country to take full advantage of what's not available. So in our mind, we are still going to be advocating, but it's really about implementation advocacy. That's really ensuring that these programs are used fully for what they're intended. Uh, and part of what we were able to get in the infrastructure bill were some provisions that really made it clear uh, transportation alternatives goes to alternatives to transportation, that there's, there's more there that really will ensure they go to trails, walking and biking. So that will be a lot of our work is really helping partners to take full advantage. We're quite excited also at how states are supporting trail development. And we had real concerns in 2020 that with the kind of early stages of, of the pandemic, state budgets we thought would be in real trouble and that there could be a real scarcity of funds, there could be capacity challenges, all kinds of other things. We've seen the opposite, that state budgets are doing well and that's good in all kinds of ways but also that states are essentially investing alongside those federal funds. And so we've seen states um, as geographically diverse as California, Utah, North Carolina, Virginia, make major commitments, tens of millions of dollars for trail programs in their states. And that's important, not just in terms of that investment, but many of these, these federal programs have match requirements. And that will be integral to helping these states tap into those sources. So to answer your question, Jorge, a lot of it is about helping our partners take full advantage of advocating at the state level to really follow what other places have done 
And then it's bringing new models that essentially build that public will for investments in trails. One of them that we're uh, quite excited about is the trail caucus model. That's something we started in Ohio. And essentially you can create a caucus for anything. There can be a caucus for almost any issue. And we decided let's create one in Ohio for trails. What was really exciting is that over time, more than half of the legislature has joined this caucus almost equally bipartisan. And it's formed a very powerful way to create new programs, new investments at the state level for trails that's now being picked up and replicated in places like Indiana, Wisconsin, and others. So in some ways, although we celebrated big victories around infrastructure and uh, around the Rock Island and others, we also, after taking a breath, realized that the work's not done. In some ways, it's more far flung and intense as you move forward. And just to back up a little bit, you mentioned the, the matching requirement for the, this, this federal source of money. I know that earlier we had a question sent in uh, discussing some strategies to make those matches work. Can you touch on that a tiny bit? Yeah, uh, Hori, tell me a little bit more about what the, the question was. I'm going to pull it up really here. I had it in my email. Excuse me. Um, Discussing the 20% match requirement for most federally funded rail trail projects and how the issue of federal toll credits mm -hmm. and how so federal toll credits. Yeah, interesting. And I think it's from, from Alex. So I know this is being looked at in a few places. I think in New Hampshire, there's been some, some talk. So uh, Alex, the answer is we are uh, we're tracking how this is being considered in different places. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we're, we're trying to really pioneer this match, um, the kind of the diversity of matches. We've seen community foundations step in in different places, um, do either private funding or even what's called pay for success, essentially kind of private investment. Uh, the toll credit thing I think is also uh, promising as well. And, and you might've already done this, but I'd encourage you to connect with Tom Sexton who is leading our New England Trail Network? Because uh, I think, in some ways, that's really the the question: is is in some places that don't have, as say, the robust resources of a California, it does create does necessitate some more ingenuity in some cases. Yeah, and actually, this is kind of going on to the next talking point that I wanted to get through to you, talking about ingenuity and kind of using templates that we have that we know work, like the trail caucuses in. in started in Ohio, obviously. Um, can you talk a little bit about the playbook and the upcoming virtual summit for 2022? Yeah, so, and um, I'm really tickled if someone asked or uh, you might've keep me up here, Jorge, in some ways. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, let me describe a little bit. So I'm sure most supporters here know about our Trail Nation initiative. And that is in eight different places across the country, We've been working to create interconnected trail systems that really link communities across whole cities or whole regions. And it's really all motivated by this, this commitment we have, not just to create trails, but to create trails that connect, connect communities, connect regions together, because we found that that's when you get true mode shift. You give people the opportunity to both use trails for recreation, but then to use them as alternatives for any different um, ideas for to get where they want to go. And those have been really exciting to, um, to pioneer in, in places like Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, DC, Miami, Milwaukee, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and it's just exciting to see those really provide a, a huge new resource for those, those communities. At the same time, uh, we hear people all across the country wanting to do the same thing, wanting to really create a system for walking and biking. So what we're going to do this year is to launch a playbook, which is essentially kind of the whole how-to, how do you create an interconnected trail system in a community or region? And that's everything from how do you finance it? How do you do the geospatial analysis? How do you involve community in robust ways? How do you brand it? All the different things that we've learned throughout our decades of existence and especially through Trail Nation, we'll be documenting and essentially putting out open source for the country and for the movement. And so for us, it's just, I think, an exciting way to um, be of service to more places than we could be directly on the ground. 
Related to that, we're going to be starting a national learning community, which is really inviting communities and partners from across the country to take up the playbook, to implement what works for them, but also to form an ongoing community where uh, those participants can learn from what's happening in Trail Nation, ultimately learn from each other. And we think create <clears throat> the next level of uh, investment when it comes to trails as full systems that provide opportunities for both recreation, but also transportation. I think to me, what's exciting is we get asked often, can we come to a community and help folks create a new trail system? And we don't like saying no, but we, are, we don't have enough people to do that just ourselves. So hopefully this really creates a, a whole um, a network of folks who can do this alongside us. Yeah, and do you wanna mention the, the, the virtual summit? Also, I mean, that kind of ties into this trying to be everywhere at once. Mindset yeah, so have sometimes. honestly, we're, <laughs> we're still figuring that out. And, I, and maybe the thing that, you know, when we talk about, any group talks about what it's been like the last few years, we've been doing a lot of our work virtually and um, are excited to hopefully be able to do more in-person connecting um, this year in all different forms. But for something as big and vast as this, we will do this as a virtual summit, just because it gets as many people who are interested to participate. I will just say more details about that to come as we finish the playbook. But the idea is um, a gathering of, of hundreds of trail experts from across the country, both to learn what we learned, but also to then share what they have and, and how they can support each other. Yeah, you know, two years into this, and I finally figured out how to blur the background of my in my Zoom calls. So <laughs> I'm I'm slowly getting there as everyone adjusts and you know adapts to this new way of uh, conducting um, conducting advocacy. It's not like the movement stopped in March 2020. You know, we kept going, and uh, I think that's something that a lot of people need to remember is that we're not just going to kind of sit on our heels. We're going to take advantage of what is out there. Sure, that's right. And it's required any organization and business to be adaptive. I'm really proud of our staff and partners for being resilient and finding new ways to work together and to collaborate, um, especially because this work is so often local and relationship based. It's been challenging, but I've been just, I've marveled at how folks have been creative. I will say personally, I'm passing three years this started on the 13th. I think literally today is my yeah. three-year anniversary. It is. That's, <laughs> that's funny. I, I'm, I'm literally hitting three years in the job, and it's been the most rewarding experience of my career in so many different ways, but I've done two-thirds of the job during the pandemic and virtually, so um, I've been honored to do it all this time, but I will say I'm really looking forward to just doing what I love best, which is getting out, connecting with people, Seeing the great work that's been done and not always doing it across the screen. So let's all hope there's more freedom to do that soon. Yeah, and someone uh, submitted a question in the chat asking about the upcoming Trailblazer tour. Um, in that vein, we are hoping to do a, a tour coming up this year. It will probably be limited capacity and most likely would be on the Great American Rail Trail route. That's all I can kind of say right now. Obviously, we have to plan a little bit more and uh, solidify dates and solidify those plans, but just just so you know, that's that's the info I can give you right now. Um, and speaking of time flying, we are coming kind of close to our uh, 3.30 mark. I did want to give everyone a chance, an opportunity to submit any questions you might have, if you have anything or comments that you want to pop into the Q&A really quick while we're looking at the time. If not, you'll hear me and Ryan talk about Brooks Saddles for two minutes or talk about our next <laughs> ride. Um, I do think that I'm planning on going and doing a bike ride relatively soon when um, it's not 30 degrees out every day. Um, <laughs> somebody wants to know, what is the photo behind you, Ryan? That's the Great Allegheny Passage. Everyone knows that. I think I took this in 2020. Um, I've done it a few times with friends and family. During the height of the pandemic, I was itching to get out. And so I did just a full on solo ride of it as what I 
felt was the most socially distance way to have an adventure. And I, this, I believe, is from that trip, which was intense and challenging, but I'll never forget it. Did you bring your iodine tablets for the the, the water pumps? I, I I have I forgot what I use. It's something else that doesn't taste like iodine, but yeah, I, I did bring that. Um, One of the now I appreciate the question that Jorge and we could riff on this forever. Let me just note a couple other things in terms of what happened last year, this year, just super proud of. I'd want to know. Then we can um we can hit those kind of last questions. Uh, but just you know, wanting to report on what you all support and have invested in. Um, we could have done many of the things we did without you. One was we hit past 2,000 miles completed on a Great American Rail Trail um, last year. Big milestone, still much more to go. But now, as with the, the, in the new sources available, we will see real acceleration. Trail Link, Jorge mentioned, uh, our biggest year up before the pandemic of usage was about seven, eight million. Uh, in 2020, 10.5 million, 10.5 million people used trailing to get outdoors and be active. And we expected that to settle down a bit. We hit it again last year. Another example of that this is a real change in attitudes and behaviors. And we just feel honored to have trailing as a source for people to, to get out. And we started a new campaign called Trail Moments asking people to share what trails had meant to them throughout this experience. Invite anyone here to go on trailmoments.com um, and share, because we've heard from 2,000 people across the country that it wasn't just a way for folks to get a distraction. For some people, it literally was life-saving. And um, if you have a chance, um, take a look at that. In some ways, it's maybe the best way to see your own generous return on investment is what you've done, what you've helped us to do is literally at times save lives and help people maintain wellness and discover new things about their community. And um, you, you will tear up, you will be inspired it, and you might just tear up if you read a few of those. Uh, and I see I have another question from Alex, who at RGC is primarily tasked with implementing the trail provisions of the new infrastructure bill. That's a whole team, uh, Alex, but I would say it's very much our policy team that led the advocacy on the creation of the connectivity bill and the other provisions. Uh, Kevin Mills, our vice president of policy, leads that with a whole amazing team, Marianne Fowler, Patrick Loyon, uh, Mary, Mary Ellen Kuntz. So they are the, the primary leads there, but I would say this is another example of the power of having both federal advocacy and a real robust state and local strategy. Our Trail Nation team, will be very much involved in uh, ad activating all those partners, not just helping them to use those funds, but really being advocates that those are, need to be used in the most efficient way. So this whole process has been very much an all organization effort that will continue this year as well. Thanks, Ryan. And just to wrap things up, I, I this kind of just come to my head, came to my head, but if you could in any way explain to people who are interested in trails or your uh, being an advocate, in your opinion, what is one of the best ways to do so, or um, what can you do to push the trail movement forward? Well, I think I would just say this sounds gratuitous, but being a part of RTC is um, is a huge part. I mean, we're very proud that we're the country's largest trails walking and biking organization, and we can't do it without the support of each of you, without what you do in your own communities to then move on those action alerts we put out. So I'm not just saying that because it's it's my job, but truly you are a part of our movement, a part of an organization that has made transformative change in so many different ways. Um, I would also say that this work, as much as we operate often on the federal level, is hyper-local. And so I, I think the more that you also can um, find ways to be active in your own community, uh, almost every community of some size has a, um, a biking uh, coalition of some type, and many times they're, they're focused on not just the recreational side, but the infrastructure side. And that I think the more that um, you can join us in really making the case with your own local elected officials about the power of trails, walking and biking, what can be done when you really do more short trips by walking and biking for individual health for the environment is huge. And it really takes every um, state legislator, 
um, every U.S. Rep representative to understand that and ultimately then be a champion in their community. So you can do it on a lot of levels. I know many of you do that, and we're just truly grateful for what you do. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And to answer the last question that came in, um, we want to thank all of you from the 40 plus staff members of RTC. And I'm saying that questioningly because we are doing some hiring currently, and I don't know if all those positions have been filled, but is that is that a good, good number right there, Ryan? 40 plus? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure about the question, but I will say, so we are, the, we are 45. The question was how many staff, how many, people? How many yeah. staff members? Thanks, Jennifer. So we are, we are 45, and I would say, although we are the, the largest in our sector, um, you know, we are still not, we punch way above our weight. And so 45 of us do a lot and um, tend to work pretty hard. I will say what's really exciting for us, and again, a, a product of the investment that you all make is we're growing as an organization. Um, this last couple of years was challenging in many ways, but we were just so blessed to have supporters not only continue, but in many ways, grow their investment, um, you know, move to being sustaining supporters in different ways. And that's allowed us not just to meet the challenges that confronted us, but to actually grow and meet that, that uh, opportunity. So we'll be adding staff in all different forms, helping us to do the outreach to communities to um, do the advocacy implementation to better and fully resource the implementation of the Great American Rail Trail, and then to really build out uh, this learning network that's going to be a benefit to communities across the country. So we'll always be lean and resourceful in certain ways, but we are lucky to have the resources to really meet the challenges ahead of us. We're really grateful for that. Thanks, Ryan, and thanks for everyone on the call. For the sake of time, I'm going to be hitting the end button. And I hope everyone has a great day and stay safe.